Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. In an effort to rein in inflation, the Bank of Canada's raised its benchmark interest rate yet again. We will explain by how much. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has responded to criticism about his new handgun legislation. And the owner of a Lethbridge greenhouse explains which indoor and outdoor plants could be toxic for your pets. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The Bank of Canada has increased its benchmark interest rate by half a percentage point for the second straight setting. The move aimed at reining in inflation leaves its policy rate at 1.5%. The central bank warned of further rate hikes as inflation is now over 6%. It adds it is fully prepared to act even more forcefully to meet its inflation target of 2%, an indication that more aggressive rate hikes are on the way. A new study by Canadians who don't own homes finds that 50% don't believe they will ever get into the housing market. The survey was done by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada. 29% believed it was somewhat likely that they may own a home one day. The survey was released as the Bank of Canada raised interest rates for the third time this year. It found that 90% of respondents view rising interest rates as their greatest hurdle to home ownership. The June 3rd deadline is just around the corner for Canadians to purchase a CPC membership in order to be able to vote for who they want to see as the next leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Roman Babber is one of the six candidates vying for the top job. He says part of his platform is respecting the opinions of all Canadians and pushing to end equalization. You can't restore democracy in our country without restoring democracy in the Conservative Party of Canada. Okay, so I'm going to respect diversity of opinion. I will never ever penalize a member of parliament for expressing an opinion. They serve their constituents, not the boss. We've got to bring Western Canada into the conversation. I will turn Canada into the natural resources superpower that we ought to be. I'll end equalization. And um, I'll also look to make sure that we have fairness in the distribution of, of, of votes and seats that it is comparable to the population. The Conservative Party of Canada will choose its new leader this September. NDP finance critic Shannon Phillips is not giving up on seeing a Lethbridge police officer fired. After the Alberta Law Enforcement Review Board dismissed her appeal last March about the penalty decisions aimed at Sergeant Jason Carrier, she took it up with the Alberta Court of Appeal, which has ruled that she can appeal at least part of her complaint pertaining to the sergeant's temporary demotion. The decision says she's granted permission to appeal the authority of the presiding officer to impose a temporary demotion in rank. The police officer involved faced a disciplinary hearing in 2020 and received a demotion in rank for the span of one year. This is a case stemming from 2017 when two police officers allegedly spied on Phillips in a Lethbridge diner and later posted photos of her online. The officer who posted the photos has since resigned, but Sergeant Carrier was handed a demotion for not reporting the actions of that officer. New recruits for the Lethbridge Fire Department took part in a training exercise Wednesday morning consisting of engine operation techniques. BCN's Angela Stewart caught up with some of the new recruits who say they're responding well to the training, which will help them prepare for real-life scenarios. It was training day for this batch of new firefighting recruits. Wednesday's lesson was all about the nozzle forward system. It's a class for firefighters to learn hose line management and techniques on how to better attack a burning blaze. Uh, we just had uh, a cadre from all over North America come to Lethbridge this weekend and, and do a class for the region. So we're uh, building upon that with our own recruits. Mark Matheson, fire training officer, says they have about 12 new recruits for this round of training. I love working with new recruits. Uh, they don't have any preconceived notions about uh, procedures. Uh, so they're trying to do the best they can. They're trying to impress. Um, it's been really great. We're getting to learn a lot of good like safety techniques, how to uh, advance forward into a house, keep our guys safe. Recruit Robert Clority, whose background is working in EMS, says making the transition to fire and having the hands-on training has so far been an enjoyable experience for him. I've been loving it. It's been really good. Um, it's, a, it's a very physically uh, daunting um, profession. When you see this hands-on stuff, you get a, you get to actually feel how everything works, how everything moves. I haven't had a lot of experience on the fire side, so 
more excited to see what those differences are going to be. The same could also be said for recruit Logan LaRue. I am come from the EMS side of things as well. I uh, wanted to get into the fire stuff because it's kind of a team environment. Everybody's super friendly and competitive and it's, uh, it's really positive. Training will be done in mid-July, then the trainees will have to complete a mentorship program. You'll see them on the streets late July working with our crews hand in hand. For Bridge City News, I'm Angela Stewart. There appears to have been an increasing number of house fires in Lethbridge over the past year. Troy Hicks, fire prevention officer with the Lethbridge Fire Department, says a number of the fires are attributed to people not properly disposing of their cigarettes. He says some fires have been caused from people butting out in planters. We have everything from uh, planters or we have, uh, we've had issues with plastic buckets that the person thought there was water in. Um, just, just, uh, we've even had issues with, um, people using a proper ashtray, but it's an ashtray that's meant for indoors, not outdoors. And they'll have it on their back patio. We all know the winds here in Southern Alberta and they go outside, they have their cigarette, they put it out, but it's not really out. And once they go back inside, the wind picks up, blows those embers around and whether it's a lawn chair or anything like that, it catches it on fire. Fire prevention officer, Troy Hicks will have more safety tips for us coming up in the second half of our program. Those who are visually impaired rely heavily on guide dogs. Now, their furry companions help with mobility issues and assisting people reach their destination safely. A client with Canadian Guide Dogs for the Blind says her dog, however, is much more than just a navigator. It, it does get, you know, there is that emotional component. And when your dog has to retire, it's, it's really a big deal because you, you know, you think about getting attached to your pets. We, we get attached to our dogs as as dogs, but also because this is this is who we've been sort of working with. This dog goes almost everywhere I go. So I, I think sometimes that emotional component gets a little bit lost because people want to know what the dogs do. And I totally understand that. But when your dog, you know, has something happen to it or it retires or when it goes to dog heaven, I mean, that's that's one of the hardest things about having a guide dog is the fact that they don't live forever. Golden says she used to be a cane user, but decided to submit an application for a dog back in 2006, and just a year later received her very first seeing eye dog. Now, walking your dog can seem like a normal task that most pet owners enjoy each and every day, but there are toxic plants to watch out for when taking your dog out for a stroll. Karen Barbie with Greenhaven Garden Center in Lethbridge says there are even toxic house plants that you need to watch out for to protect your special pets. That one is a calancho. A calancho is a flowering house plant. That is, that is toxic. And Diefenbachia, we've always known about that one. That's another one that's toxic and it can get fairly large. Uh, Schifflera is called the umbrella tree. That one is also toxic as well. And peace lily. And peace lily is quite common uh, for people wanting to have it's a shiny green leaf and a beautiful white flower on it. So that's another one. Uh, so it does help if you're buying a new houseplant to do that research just to avoid that possibility. Now Barbie says the Canadian Dog Walkers Association provides more pictures of the plants and details of symptoms your pet may have if they do in fact get into them. Well, we enjoy lots of sunshine again today, a nice day for taking your dog for a walk, and that trend should continue for the next couple of days. Jeanette Roche is in now with an early peak of the forecast. Jeanette, the warm temperatures should continue for the next few days? Yeah, well, they should, Hal. We're finally going to be seeing temperatures sitting at and just slightly above average for this time of year. Uh, before that, though, we are going to be seeing an overnight risk of potential frost. Overnight low, 4 degrees, before we get into a lovely day on Thursday, looking at sunshine with uh, partly clouds, uh, partly cloudy skies later on in the day. High of 21 degrees, so there we go. We are higher than average for this time of year. After that, we're going to be seeing mainly high teen temperatures before cooling down with some moisture next week. I will get into all of those details though later on in the newscast. Thanks so much Jeanette. Well it's almost time for the grand opening of the new Festival Square. The area will be located on the corner of 3rd Avenue and 6th Street in downtown Lethbridge. Festival Square will be an outdoor event space that will host farmers markets, musical events, outdoor movie showings and social gatherings. The project comes off the back of the Municipal Stimulus Program from the Alberta government to complete the close to $2 million project. City Council voted 6-3 last summer to move forward with the square. 
Uh, right now, this $1.7 million project, which is fully funded by the province of Alberta through the Municipal Stimulus Program, is currently uh, under budget, which we're also excited about. Uh, and we're just uh, we're thrilled to see the progress and what this uh, space will lend itself to the, to the ongoing efforts of revitalization of our downtown. Every week I drive by just to see what's going on and to see how much more progress we've made and choosing everything from the design of the concrete and the lighting and the pillars and the overhead bar that's uh, going to welcome people into Festival Square and all of those choices have been made by a fabulous group of people and, and to watch it grow and develop and I can't wait to see what the next three weeks they're going to fly by and then all of a sudden we're going to have this beautiful space uh, welcoming everybody on uh, the 22nd of June for the for the ribbon cutting ceremony. So it's extremely meaningful and it gives uh, businesses and events another avenue, another facility to, to set themselves up in and uh, catch that much more foot traffic in the eye of that many more people. Other events including Street Wheelers and Oktoberfest will also be hosted at Festival Square. I can't wait. Lovers of the solar system are set for a very special treat in Lethbridge. The Lethbridge Astronomy Society has put together a life-size model of the solar system that is scaled to the full size of the dome of the clock tower at the post office in our city's downtown core. Now, the president of the society, Tom Anderson, explained that the project is a long time coming and will be a great tourist attraction for Lethbridge. Third generally is a lot of interest in space and the solar system these days. Hardly a week goes by when you don't hear something on the, on the news about it. Um, so the interest I think is out there and I think people will want to come here and see this, um, see this model because the next closest one is in Quebec and you know the other ones are mostly in Europe and, and in, the, uh, in the U.S. The model was supported and funded by 30 project members from Lethbridge and across southern Alberta. Lethbridge College is hosting Cooley Fest this fall. The 60th anniversary celebration event will take place on campus Saturday, September the 17th. The fun festival will include live music, carnival games, food trucks, and even a pie eating contest. I better sign up for that one. Organizers say Cooley Fest is a fun and unique way to kick off the new school year for both staff and students. Now, those attending Cooley Fest are encouraged to do their part for the environment by walking, biking, or carpooling to the event. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney released a policy aimed at protecting Alberta government political staff from workplace harassment. The policy outlines how employees can make complaints and clarifies how an allegation is to be investigated. Kenney says he and his ministers have also signed a statement committing to a harassment-free workplace. A lawsuit was filed against Kenny's office last fall by a former staff member who alleges she was fired for speaking out about a toxic workplace environment. Premier Kenny also provided details today of continued support for the Alberta Surgical Initiative with the Enoch Cree Nation. Kenny says the province is starting to get ahead of the surgical backlog and this partnership will help more patients across central Alberta. I am pleased to announce that Enoch Cree Nation in partnership with Surgical Centers Incorporated is the preferred proponent to offer uh, surgeries here in the Edmonton region. Uh, while the contract is still being finalized, we anticipate that this agreement will offer uh, an additional 3,000 much needed orthopedic surgeries here in the Edmonton region. Kenny adds that this new initiative will help those who are looking more specifically for knee or hip replacement surgery. Now there's a movement afoot by groups who would like to see Alberta separate and become its own sovereign nation. Now is this feasible? What would be involved to legally separate from Canada? Dennis Maudry is the CEO of the Alberta Prosperity Project and he says if Alberta were to leave Canada, it would give us more negotiating power. Alberta has never had negotiating power in its entire 116 years of existence. But the prizes for um, Alberta independence, either within Canada or untethered to Canada, are numerous and spectacular. And this is something that a lot of Albertans still don't really understand or appreciate and don't understand really how we can get there um, legally and efficiently and in a very timely fashion, i.e. within the next uh, three to five years. Make sure you catch the full interview with Dennis Madri and BCN's Jeanette Roche discussing Alberta independence coming up in the second half of our program. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe says Ottawa's proposed law around guns is problematic. 
If passed, the legislation would ban possession, sale, and transfer of handguns and the possession of assault weapons. Mo says the law would punish legal gun owners who are already following rules. In a social media post, he says it is nothing more than virtue signaling from the Trudeau Liberals. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau responded to criticism that his new handgun legislation is an attack on law-abiding gun owners. We recognize that the vast majority of gun owners use them safely and in accordance with the law. But other than using firearms for sport shooting and hunting, there is no reason anyone in Canada should need guns in their everyday lives. And Canadians certainly don't need assault-style weapons that were designed to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time. Well, it was a high-scoring affair in Game 1 of the Western Conference Final between the Edmonton Oilers and the Colorado Avalanche. The Avs came out on top 8-6. The Oilers players, to a man, admit that they have to play better defensively if they hope to get past Colorado and make it to the Stanley Cup Final. We obviously have to change... Um change something you know we, we can't be giving up that many goals um, and, and expect to win a Western Conference finals game that's the second time this has happened um, you know we, we got to make sure we're ready to go right off the bat and um, we'll, we'll be better we know that we can skate with them we're, we're one of the fastest teams in the league and, and, and when we play to our strength and play to our quickness then um, we're a really hard team to handle. Um, yeah, I think you can you can see spurts of it in, in the third period, but it's obviously not good enough if you're down, I don't know, 6-3 or, or whatever it is. So uh, you're just chasing the game from there on. So, um, yeah, we, we, we just got to come out a little, little sharper, a little harder. Game two between the Oilers and Avalanche goes Thursday night, 6 p.m. in Colorado. It's a Hollywood story the world has been watching very closely. The Johnny Depp Amber Heard defamation case. Well, on Wednesday, the jury ruled that Johnny Depp won his defamation lawsuit against his ex-wife, and the jury awarded him $15 million in damages. That includes $10 million in compensatory damages and $5 million in punitive damages. The jury also awarded Heard $2 million in compensatory damages. Depp originally sued Heard for $50 million after she wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post in 2018 in which she called herself a public figure representing domestic abuse. Heard countersued Depp for $100 million. Well, we had lots of sunshine in Lethbridge today and that warming trend will be continuing. Full weather details are on deck. Well, it was another beautiful day here in the city of Lethbridge. Jeanette Roche is in now with all of our weather details. Jeanette, we're kind of what, seasonal for this time of year? Yeah, well, they should help, particularly on a Thursday when we're going to be seeing a high of 21 degrees. So that's a little higher than our seasonal high right now, which is around uh, around 20 degrees. So we're looking at a high of 21 tomorrow with partly cloudy skies. After that, we're going to be hovering more in the teen temperature, 17 the high for Friday with mainly cloudy skies. Cloudy skies also expected on Saturday with a high of 18. Sunday 21, but cloudy skies and then that rain is going to develop on Sunday evening. We're looking at a 30% chance Sunday night into Monday and Tuesday. We're looking at 60% chance of showers with a high of 16 degrees for both of those days. So that is uh, cooling down a little bit there to round out that seven day forecast. Uh, average high for this time of year, as I was saying, 20 degrees, average low seven. 32 degrees was where we were at back in 1986. And we were sitting at a chilly minus two back in 1951. 529 is when the sun rose this morning. One minute uh, longer than yesterday. 930 is our sunset this evening. So we're sitting at 16 hours and one minute of daylight today. So over on the west coast tomorrow, we're seeing a mix of sun and cloud. Uh, Victoria's high 16 degrees, 20 the high in Vancouver. Going to feel more like 25 though inland where it's getting much warmer there. 21 the high tomorrow in Edmonton with sunny skies and a high of 20 degrees tomorrow with partly a cloudy skies in Calgary. As we look to the rest of the prairies, we're seeing a decent conditions for sure. 21 degrees the high in Saskatoon. Same thing for Regina. Regina seeing winds up to 40 kilometers per hour, up to 50k winds expected in Winnipeg tomorrow. High of only 10 degrees and a chance of showers there. As we look to the central part of the country, Toronto's high 23, 22 the high in Ottawa, 21 in Montreal with a mix of sun and clouds. So pretty decent temperatures there in that central part of the country. As we look further east into the Maritimes, 
Moving on over to Atlantic Canada here. Fredericton's high, 22 degrees, lots of sunshine. Beautiful sunny skies expected tomorrow in Halifax as well. 13 only the high in Charlotte Town tomorrow. Uh, St. John's looking at two to four millimeters of rain and up to 70 kilometer per hour winds. High of six degrees there. So there you have it. That is your forecast. The Bank of Canada raised its key interest rate by a half a percentage point to one and a half percent as it continues to battle sky high inflation. Now it warned that it is going to raise rates even higher to get inflation under control. It is currently sitting at 6.8 percent while the bank says its target is 2 percent. Vermilion Energy has completed its acquisition of La Crota Exploration. Calgary-based Vermilion said it would acquire the junior energy company in a deal worth $477 million. La Crota is a Montney-focused oil and natural gas producer with property located in northeastern British Columbia and northwestern Alberta. Vermilion says as a result of the deal, it will acquire 81,000 acres of Montney mineral rights in the Peace River Arch area straddling the Alberta and B.C. boundary. Vermillion says La Crota shares will be delisted from the TSE and the company will cease to be a reporting issuer in Canada. Deutsche Bank subsidiary DWS as its chief executive is resigning after authorities raided its offices. The raids were part of a probe into claims that the company exaggerated the sustainable credentials of some of its financial products. CEO Asoka Wurman plans to step down after the company's annual general meeting on June the 9th. In a statement, he said the allegations made against DWS and myself have become a burden for the company and for me and my family. Wormann will be succeeded by Stefan Hoops, who oversees Deutsche Bank's corporate bank business. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 15 points on the day to finish at 20,713. The Dow was down 176 points to 32,813. The S&P 500 was down 30 points to 4,101, and the Nasdaq was down 86 on the day to 11,994. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 59 cents to 115.26 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was up 55 cents to 870 U.S. Gold was up 3 cents to 1846.63 U.S. an ounce, and silver was even on the day at 21.83 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $16.05 per bushel. Barley's at 1023, canola's at 2626, and corn is at $12.06 per bushel. Live cattle were up 228 to 13280. Feeder cattle August contract was up 460 to 169.73, and lean hogs were up $1.83 to 10980. The Canadian dollar was even over the past 24 hours at 7901 US. Recapping one of our top stories, the Bank of Canada has increased its benchmark interest rate by a half a percentage point for the second straight setting. The move aimed at reining in inflation leaves its policy rate at 1.5%. The central bank warned of further rate hikes as inflation is now at 6.8%. Could Alberta separate from Canada? What would it take for our province to become its own independent sovereign nation? Dennis Maudry with the Alberta Prosperity Project says it was entirely possible and would give Albertans more negotiating power. He will explain in an interview with BCN's Jeanette Roche shortly. Well, discussing politics it seems to be the order of the day any day in Alberta. New political initiatives are nothing new to us here in the province. And lately there's a regional resistance towards products like Alberta oil and gas and new pipelines to deliver the province's petrochemicals to markets in Canada and abroad. And we've brought you conversations in the past months about different ideas on the future of the Alberta industry and even the province's plan or the province's place in the Canadian Confederation. But joining me today is Dr. Dennis Madri of the Alberta Prosperity Project. Dr. Madri, thanks so much for coming on once again today. And you're joining us from Edmonton, I believe, right? Yes, I am. And thank you for having me. Dr. Madri, we've had you on the show in the past regarding Alberta Health and government policy on health care, but today we want to speak with you about another project that you're a part of, and that is the Alberta Pros Prosperity Project. So first of all, please tell us more about what this project is all about. What's its goal? Sure. <clears throat> well, to begin with, the structure is 
that we formed the Alberta Prosperity Society, um, registered with Service Alberta, and it has a board of governors. And the um, purpose of the Alberta Society uh, primarily is the governance of the Alberta Prosperity Project. The Alberta Prosperity Project is primarily um, an initiative to unite all Albertans, businesses, and organizations to protect Albertans and their own interests, uh, self-determination, individual freedoms and rights, and prosperity by enabling Alberta to chart a new path forward. Um, that new path forward is either um, independence within Canada, meaning that Alberta has far more control over its wealth and the programs that uh, truly fall under provincial jurisdiction, but that has been usurped uh, by federal government overreach. Or alternatively, um, if we're not able to fix Alberta circumstances within Confederation, then Alberta becomes independent in another way as an independent sovereign constitutional republic. And so what the Alberta Prosperity Project is trying to accomplish is to educate Albertans, because that's what we are. We're an educational society, the purpose of which is to educate Albertans on the rationale and the merits of protecting their own interests, their individual freedoms and rights and prosperity by the only means possible. And that is for the next government to have sufficient leverage, use the term leverage in business, um, to, to have an upper hand in negotiations. In politics, it's power or negotiating power. And Alberta has never had negotiating power in its entire 116 years of existence. But the prizes for um, Alberta independence, either within Canada or untethered to Canada, are numerous and spectacular. And this is something that a lot of Albertans still don't really understand or appreciate and don't understand really how we can get there um, legally and efficiently and in a very timely fashion, i.e. within the next uh, three to five years. Uh, that's how quickly it can happen. So you're mentioning there's great benefits. Maybe explain what some of those benefits might be. Well, for example, right now we are taxed federally um, in Alberta to the tune of about $60 billion a year, of which we get back uh, only about $27 billion. And given the price of oil coming up, our, our tax base <clears throat> federally is going to go up even further. So one of the benefits, for example, um, is when you realize that we overfund the pension plan by uh, $3 billion a year, by having control of our own wealth, pensioners are immediately benefited by a minimum of $3 billion a year. We then have the opportunity to do some very unique things, such as to uh, gradually reduce over a period of, few year, of a few years our taxation. So we could easily get to a flat tax of 10%, um, both uh, personally and corporately. In addition to that, you know, I like to ask the question of various audiences that we speak to, do you own your own property without a mortgage? And a certain number of people will hold their hand up. And then I say, well, just don't pay your property taxes and you'll find out who really owns your property. And the point that I'm getting at here is that Alberta is unique in terms of the wealth generation potential. And we would have an opportunity here also to gradually phase out property taxes, in which case then for the very first time, Albertans owning property would actually own it and wouldn't be responsible for paying what really is a rent to the federal government or a tax to the federal government. So those are just some of the things, but the opportunity to improve healthcare, um, education, social services, resolving the problem of the homeless um, is at hand. And we know, how to, we know how to do it. We've drafted it. We've worked long and hard hours working with constitutional lawyers and very bright uh, professionals to come up with what is a very cogent, very realizable uh, and understandable plan to get to 
nirvana, if you will, for Alberta. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Dr. Madri, you've been working a lot through the years in public policy. So why was it important for you to champion this new political cause? What made you want to get involved? And what's your role? Right. And, and very good question. Um, but just to be crystal clear, we're not political. We are apolitical. We don't back any any uh, party. We're um, non um, nonprofit and um, nonpartisan. That's very, very important to understand because it doesn't matter the government that's in power as long as they understand what is required in order to protect Alberta's interests, individual freedoms and rights and prosperity, then any government can do it. Okay. Um, all they've got to do is have the courage to do it. So it's not about picking sides in politics at all. No, it's not. It's not about picking sides at all. It's about it's about understanding what you want uh, in terms of your freedoms and rights and your prosperity going forward. If you like big government and high taxes uh, and being controlled in everything that you do, well, that's one tiny group of the population. Uh, but if you want freedoms and individual freedoms and rights and you want to be able to travel unfettered and these sorts of things and you don't you, you you want to retain the majority of the wealth that you generate well then here is an opportunity for Alberta to really chart a new path forward and like I say within Canada or without Canada and it's an opportunity as well I might say to actually save Canada in a way in which um, I believe the majority of the population would want. So why did I get involved? Um, well, I got I got involved now that I'm retired. As you know, I was a cardiac surgeon and a transplant surgeon. And I got involved really simply because I guess you could look at it this way. For my entire career, I was able to help one person at a time through my surgical practice. Here is an opportunity uh, to help millions of people to protect really what are the values and principles that we were brought up in, in terms of Western civilization. And we see those being eroded uh, very substantively. And um, I, just, I just figured that, well, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? So I wanted to be involved with some very bright other individuals who were like-minded and who also want the best for Albertans in a way in which no Albertan is left behind and everybody's quality of life and standard of living is dramatically improved. And that we can prove that can happen by adopting uh, what we are recommending for policy and governance and bylaws for the next government uh, in power. Okay. whatever happens in a year from now. That's very interesting. So how would Alberta become untangled from the rest of Canada? That doesn't seem very easy. Right. It, it, it actually is very, very easy. And it's so simple uh, to understand because the Supreme Court actually defined it in the Clarity Act. So what really is required is, and this is a unifying concept, both for those people who want a better deal in confederation for Alberta and those who want Alberta to get to, to become a new um, independent sovereign nation. So <clears throat> what the Clarity Act uh, was all about was defining the parameters around a referendum on independence. Because a referendum, a successful referendum on independence gives Alberta the moral and legal legitimacy to chart a new path forward. The three components of the Clarity Act that are relevant to understand are number one, there has to be a clear question posed to the voters. Number two, there has to be a clear outcome. And number three, there has to be a period of negotiation. Now, with a successful referendum, then what happens, assuming that the question and the outcome are valid, then what happens is Alberta, the Alberta government has for the first time in 116 years the opportunity to negotiate with Ottawa from a position of strength. And for example, by saying, well, we want out from under Bill uh, C-69 and, and Bill C-48. We want, as the Constitution defines, complete unfettered control of the development and transport of our natural resources. We want to be able to, for example, um, um, implement 
better solutions for healthcare because right now in Alberta, our healthcare system functions in the lowest quartile and we fund it at the level of the highest quartile. So there are tremendous opportunities to improve healthcare, but you have to get out from under uh, federal regulatory overreach, which is the Canada Health Act. So these kinds of things um, can happen through negotiations, in which case if we get, if Albertans get what they want, which we have defined on our website, albertaprosperity.com, then very legitimately, Alberta could remain in confederation, but with a far better deal. And this would impact the other provinces as well, because we believe that the majority of citizens in other provinces want the same thing that Albertans want, but they can't get it because of the the federal structure that is currently in place. So there has to be very significant changes to the constitution, and you'll never get those const those kinds of constitutional changes unless you have um, the negotiating power that's given to a government um, through a referendum on independence. There's really no other way right. to achieve that objective. Okay, so what about the, that historical British Commonwealth? So how do we deal with the role of the Queen in all of this? Well, that's very, that's very simple. I mean, if we remain within Canada, then we remain, I mean, as an independent nation within Canada, then we are still attached to the uh, Commonwealth and the monarchy, and we would carry on as a parliamentary democracy. However, we have far better control of our affairs and far better control with respect to elected officials through recall um, if we are a sovereign constitutional republic. Now, there are, 54 const there are 54 nations that are involved with the Commonwealth, and 34 of them are constitutional republics. So even as an independent sovereign constitutional republic, we would maintain our um, association with the Commonwealth, but we would not have um, a relation with the monarchy per se anymore because the, the, we would be governed by uh, the rule of law, not by um, the, the way in which we've been governed uh, thus far. Mm -hmm. And how long do you think all this could take to implement in Alberta? Very, if it were to go very, through? Yeah, much, <coughs> actually very quickly. Um, so the next government, for example, can within two years take control of policing, pensions, immigration, employment insurance, and provincial tax collection. That's all legitimate within the constitution. By taking control of provincial tax collection, you then have the opportunity um, to really set the stage for the, taking control of federal taxation. So at the, roughly the two year mark, uh, you have your referendum on independence, but a referendum on independence could occur at any time. So for the next government, if the polling looked very positive, you could have that referendum at, at any point in time. But with a successful referendum on independence, then you negotiate uh, with Ottawa and the other provinces for a period of six to 12 months. And if Alberta gets what it wants, you can be sure the other provinces will want the same sort of thing. And there will be a devolution of power from the federal government to the provinces, which is the way the Constitution was originally intended. Um, and if Alberta does not get what it wants within the, uh, through those negotiations, then within that six to 12 month period, Alberta can declare that it is an independent, sovereign constitutional republic because it now has that mandate from the people. And that gives Alberta international legitimacy. So it's really, uh, it's really that simple. It's not a complicated um, process, although people who might oppose this uh, would say that it's impossible or it's too difficult and that sort of thing, but it really isn't. It's, it's really very, very simple. In this way, you also get out from under, you know, what has, um, what's coming down the line with the Great Reset you know, I mean, for people who are not inclined towards wokeness, cancel culture, critical race theory, this is an opportunity uh, to, you know, again, chart a new path forward away from that um, overarching, con you know, world control of everybody's um, movements and what they buy and where they go and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know, so. Uh, Dr. Madri, we're about out of time, but really quick, how can people find out more about the Alberta Prosperity Project? I would recommend go to the uh, website, the Alberta, albertaprosperity.com, 
Um, we have events occurring um, on a regular basis, oftentimes two or three on a weekend. You could come to an event or read the material on the website and you can sign up, become a member or a volunteer or a chapter leader at that time. Okay, fantastic, Dr. Madri. That's about all the time we have for today, but thanks so much for joining us once again here. Thanks, Jeanette. Absolutely. That was Dr. Dennis Madri of the Alberta Prosperity Project joining us from Edmonton. Residential fires can be so devastating to families. Even if there are no injuries or fatalities, you could lose everything. But too often, they are deadly and many of those fires are preventable. Joining us now to discuss fire prevention and safety is Troy Hicks. He's the fire prevention officer with the City of Lethbridge Fire Department. Troy, welcome back to Bridge City News. Thank you very much for having me again. Now, Troy, there have been a number of fires here in Lethbridge over the past year. What has been the number one cause of these blazes is maybe people not properly disposing of their cigarettes? Yeah, you know what, Hal, every, every year uh, we usually run into the same types of fires. This year, though, 2022 and even last year, 2021, we have definitely seen an increase in uh, improper disposal of smoking materials. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe because of COVID, so many more people were home and different things like working from home. But yeah, we have definitely seen an increase in uh, smoking material fires. So where are people actually disposing of their smokes? They're putting them in plant pots? Like, what are they doing with them? Absolutely. We have everything from uh, planters or we have uh, we've had issues with plastic buckets that the person thought there was water in. Um, just just uh, we've even had issues with um, people using a proper ashtray, but it's an ashtray that's meant for indoors, not outdoors. And they'll have it on their back patio. We all know the winds here in southern Alberta and they go outside. They have their cigarette. They put it out, but it's not really out. And once they go back inside, the wind picks up blows those embers around, and whether it's a lawn chair or anything like that, it catches it on fire. Are there still incidents as well of people maybe smoking in bed, falling asleep with a cigarette in their hands? I, in my time here, I haven't seen that type of fire in years. Uh, it's always been just improperly disposed of when they're putting them out. Now, Troy, we all also often see a lot of grass fires here in southwestern Alberta, especially when it's so dry. Are many of those fires caused by people maybe tossing their cigarette out the window? Absolutely. Absolutely. We, uh, we see it every day. I see it when I drive home um, up down the coolies and stuff like that. I see it on the highway. I can't 100% say that every fire on the side of the highway is caused by that. We could have anything from um, sparks from maybe trucks with their brakes are locked on or train tracks or something as well, but definitely a large percentage of fire from people throwing cigarettes out their window. So how can you educate people more as to some of the causes of the fires and what we can do to prevent those fires, such as not throwing your cigarette out the window? Absolutely. You know, we, we will put out media releases. Um, I actually put out a media release here in the city yesterday about planters and just it's not, it's not meant to be. Uh, when it comes to the highways, we have other provinces here in, in Canada that there's actually fines. People can contact the police, take the license plate number down, and people are issued very hefty fines for throwing cigarettes and stuff outside their, their windows. It is, it is something that's been discussed here in southern Alberta and in Lethbridge in particular. It's not in effect yet. Um, I, I don't think it's a bad idea. We just need people to realize. Unfortunately, we're a society of people that think, oh, it's not going to happen to me. And, you know, I used to be one of those people, too, until I started in this profession. And now, I mean, it does happen. And it, it happens a lot. And we can educate as much as we can. But the whole goal is eventually to, to try to maybe not completely get rid of these types of fires, but at the very least, lower the numbers and just continue to educate more people. You know, speaking of education, Troy, how important is it really for parents to speak to young people and their kids about the dangers of using matches and lighters? Oh, absolutely. We actually have had a couple fires already this year, um, just caused by cur curious children that, you know, maybe maybe a lighter was sitting on a table and um, mom and dad weren't watching or the babysitter wasn't watching. And they're just like, oh, I seen dad play with this. Um, yesterday, I had a 12-year-old boy here in my office, and it, it's not that he's done something wrong. His mom was just concerned about it. she didn't feel he respected being around a fire pit enough and the dangers of a fire pit. So I sat here and I talked to him for about a half hour and he was a great young man. And I educated him. I showed him the fire trucks. And we, I think he left here, maybe realized a bit more like, hey, you know what? Um, you know, this, this is important. I do need to be respectful for this kind of stuff. Are there any statistics available as to how many families actually have a fire evacuation plan in place? And what are some of the key steps with an evacuation plan? You know, as for numbers here in the city, um, it's been a long time since we've been in the schools because of COVID, but they are, I'm starting to get appointments booked, so we are getting back in to educate. 
Um, I find that the numbers are quite high when I go to schools, particularly, say, from kindergarten till about grade three or four. Uh, the, I'm happy with the numbers of people that tell me that, yes, they do have fire safety plans. When we do things like any public education event, like we're, we're at the Home and Garden Expo this year, I did have some parents come up and say how nice it was to see us and actually asked, asked me if I could go over their plan with them. Uh, for anybody else that doesn't have one or maybe someone that wants to do one, there's a few things you really need to hit. Uh, make sure everyone in your house knows what to do when the smoke detector goes off. Um, they have an escape plan. You know, they need to, if, they're, if their bedrooms are up on the second floor, you know, they can either go down the stairs or whatever they have to do to get out. And they need to have a meeting place. Uh, your meeting place should not be hopefully crossing a road just because of traffic. You want to be careful with that. And if you also have a fenced in backyard, you don't really want your meeting place to be in the backyard because now you're trapped back there if the fire gets out of control. Uh, but there is lots of things. Um, people can contact me at the fire department and I can definitely give them as much information as they like for their home safety plan. In the past, when I've spoken to firefighters, they say when you go to bed at night with your bedroom door, always keep it closed. Can Absolutely. you explain why that's so important? For sure. You know, even the normal bedroom doors, um, they're not necessarily what you would call a fire door, which is what we see in apartment buildings and hotels and stuff. But even a normal bedroom door, fire needs oxygen in order to burn. In order to keep a fire burning, there has to be enough oxygen. Oxygen is even more important than the fuel. So by closing that door, you are mitigating the amount of oxygen that fire could have. So whether the fire starts in the room, it'll keep it in that room. But if you're in your room sleeping and the fire is out in the hallway or out in something like that, by you having that door closed, you're going to keep all flame, heat, and smoke from getting into your room for a significant amount of time. Therefore, if you can't make it outside, maybe the fire is directly outside your door. Well, you have time to stay in your room. Hopefully, if you have a phone, you can call 911 and call, let us know what room you're in. Or if you don't, you open up your window and you make sure your neighbors know where you are. And when we arrive to put that fire out, we are coming straight to your window to get you out of there. And if you have an ensuite bath, I guess you can roll up a towel, a wet towel, throw it under the door to prevent a lot of the smoke from coming in, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, every, every little bit helps because as we always say, every second matters, right? So Now, Troy, when there's a fire and you have kids and your pets and you're ready to evacuate, what else should you really grab in a fire? Maybe some photo albums, special memories, or how about hockey card collections? Uh, you know what, Hal, I was looking at your questions this morning, and, and I could definitely see where you're coming from. Rule of thumb, especially as far as the fire department's concerned, you get your family, you get out. Uh, we even educate people that, one thing I will say, when a smoke detector goes off, as much as we don't like that sound, pets hate it even more. And chances are your pets are going to hide. If they're not right beside you to take them out as you're leaving, you need to leave. Uh, we don't recommend you go back in and get your pets. If you have a fire in your home and the fire department shows up and you and all your family members are outside, not calling the pets, not being a family member, but you and your kids are outside. If you let us know that there's a pet inside, we're going inside that building just the same way we would if it was you or your child or anyone in the house. And we're going to try to save that pet. Are there stickers that we can put on our windows saying, hey, there are pets inside of our home? I have seen them around. You know, there's a kennel here in Lethbridge that I take my dog on the south side. They have magnets and stickers around. I believe I've seen them at some of the other department stores and uh, home hardware stores, things like that here in the city as well. So, Troy, how common are kitchen fires? And are there fires tied in with a faulty appliance, such as a stove or microwave, or maybe simply cooking that's gotten out of control, like when I usually cook? <laughs> yeah, me as well. Um, I keep telling myself that the smoke detector is not my timer. Uh, but, you know... When I first started here, Hal, uh, 10 years, 10 plus years ago, kitchen fires were our number one type. Uh, they were the number one type here in the city. Over the last few years, that has changed. We are a lot more into smoking fires, uh, electrical fires, things like that. But the, the number one types of kitchen fires we receive um, is, say, people not paying attention when they're cooking, uh, unattended, people leaving their kitchen, leaving their stove. I know we're, we, we're a busy society. You know, we're a technological society. We're always on our phones or computers or on TV or video games. We just need to remind people that when you're cooking, you need to remember you're cooking. And that's even in the kitchen and or outside of your barbecue. It needs to be attended. You need to be paying attention. We do sometimes have fires caused by old faulty appliances. 90% of the time with those, though, it turns into be an electrical fire because lots of times what it is is it's the electrical cord or something like that that's just it's not, it's not covered. It's not doing well. It overheats, and that's what catches fire. And then the stove is actually a victim of the fire and not the cause. How about some of the older, smaller appliances that we leave plugged in? Let's say a, maybe a toaster or even a hairdryer when we take off, go to work, and maybe go on holidays. Could they also maybe potentially cause a fire? The risk is always there. Um, I experienced a fire when, many, many years ago with a coffee pot. Just the power surged. Uh, it was a very older home. The power surged, and the coffee pot actually caught on fire. 
wasn't a lot of damage. Everyone was fine, but it did. Ever since then, the only thing that stays plugged in when I leave my home, other than just for work, but when I leave for any amount of time, the only thing that stays plugged in is my fridge or freezer. Uh, unplug everything else. But And that's not to make people nervous. We need to remind people, if your house is wired properly, we also remind people, you know what, use a properly CSA, a proper CSA approved power bar that has surge protection. That will help you with that. But you know what? Why have stuff plugged in if you're not using it? So things like a coffee pot, um, toaster. I can tell you right now, mine at home are not plugged in. Um, we have not had a lot of issues here in the city of Lethbridge, but even when it comes to phone chargers, if you're not charging your phone, unplug it. Don't leave it in. Anything that's plugged in, electricity produces heat. And it leaves that slight opportunity that something could happen. I mean, most electrical outlets don't just burst into flames, but it could come down to anything. There could be dust on it. There could be, maybe it's very close to curtains that may be like very thin curtains or shears that could be close to it, that that radiant heat from the plug could catch them on fire. So I'm just, I've always lived in the habit and I have a 21 year old son that I've taught him since he was very young as well. As far as I know, he still leaves everything unplugged as well. So Troy, how much time do we typically have to evacuate a home before maybe flames or smoke overtake us? You know what, that is a great question. When I was looking at your list, I thought that was fantastic. Um, with the amount of materials and stuff used now to make new furniture, it's not exaggerating when we say every second counts. Um, years ago, even if we say as much as 10, 15 years ago, by the time something ignited in your, in your home, um, it took a few minutes before the smoke to get thick enough to set off the detector. And once that went off, you still had five, six minutes to get out. Um, nowadays with new furniture and the amount of products and petroleum products that are in furniture, the smoke is so toxic. Um, you need to get out as fast as you can <laughs> to put a number on it. I would say when your smoke detector goes off, you need to be out of that house within two minutes. And that's just really trying to train people and remind people that, you know, what, treat it as real. That smoke detector goes off, you get out and you make your way out the door. So you know, it's a good idea. Just make sure, you know, make sure your exit doors are always clear. Don't have 50 pairs of shoes in front of your doors. It's going to stop something. Don't, um, don't try to search for different things like we spoke of earlier, photo albums and stuff like that. If you get out of that place properly and you maybe you close the door, you have your doors closed, there's a good chance that fire is not going to spread and not going to damage too much of your home. Um, and I know it's heartless and I've spoken to so many families that, that, that have had fires and obviously they're, they're in a horrible point of their day in their lives. And I've even, I just try to reiterate to them, say, you know what though, you're still here hugging your child. You're still alive. It's just stuff. It can be redone. It can be redone. And there's quite a few times actually that even after a structure fire, we can send some of our firefighters in the homeowners have asked us to go in to look for passports or maybe an urn right. and some of that. And nine times out of 10, we do find it. We bring it out and give it to them. So uh, the biggest thing that we just want people to realize is you need to get out. As soon as you hear that smoke detector, teach your kids, teach everybody in the home that it's real. You need to get out and the importance of making sure they work. Smoke detectors have expiry dates. They're only good for 10 years. It seems like a lot of home builders these days are building more two, two and a half story, even three story homes. Do you think we should maybe have a rope ladder available in some of those higher homes? You know, I actually had a lady call me the other day and ask me that same question. And um, rope ladders are good. They are very good. And, and if you, um, the family member that you're going to put that rope ladder in, if you feel safe and trusting that they can use that ladder, then fantastic. I, I agree with that. That's okay. The biggest thing to remember with those rope ladders, though, is they are rated for a certain weight, and they're actually a used once, and they're no good anymore. So if you have one of those in, you can't train with it. You can't practice with it. It's just you have to be able to use it. So lots of times what I tell people is um, we don't want people breaking windows, jumping out of windows, things like that. If you're on your second floor or even your third floor and you hear your smoke detector go off, it's just like we were all told when we were kids and I teach the young kids at school now, you know, you touch, touch the door at the back of your hand because hopefully you're sleeping with your door closed. If it's not too hot, you open it. If you open it and there's just smoke in front of you, take a t-shirt, something, cover your mouth, get down nice and low, crawl down the stairs, go down on your belly, on your butt, whatever you have to do, and you need to be able to get out. If you open that door and there's flames in front of you, like I said earlier, that's when you just close your door. If you have a towel or a sweater or something you can jam on the bottom, do that. Either call 911 or open your window and start yelling so people know where you are, and that's the first place we're going. Now, every spring and fall, when we have a time change, we're always reminded to check the batteries and our smoke, de smoke detectors here. What about carbon monoxide detectors? Should we have one on every level of our home, Troy? Uh, you know what? It's, it's definitely not... It's such case dependent on that. Like, I have, a, I have a carbon monoxide detector in my home, and I have it in my basement. I have it outside my furnace room, my laundry room, things like that. 
I always tell people that if they have something like, you need to think of the different areas in your home where you could possibly get carbon monoxide. So, you know, like if you're where you have your furnace room, where you have things like that, you can have it down there. If you have a natural gas fireplace or anything like that in your home, or even a wood burning fireplace, definitely a good idea to have one on that level. I also tell people that have an attached garage, it's a good idea to have a carbon monoxide detector just outside the door that goes into their attached garage. Um, we all, like I said, we're all so busy. Sometimes we forget we've had issues with people warming up their vehicles in their attached garage with the door closed. We've had people coming home from work three o'clock in the morning. They go into the garage, they shut the garage door, they go in and they forget to shut their car off. So it's so important to have those carbon monoxide detectors. Absolutely. And it's the same thing with those batteries you need to change every year as well. Now, before we let you go here, let's talk a bit about fire extinguishers for a home. There are different types for, you know, uh, grease fires, for electrical fires. What's the best type of fire extinguisher that people can have in their house? People need to have an ABC extinguisher. Now, a Class A fire is just your ordinary combustibles, wood, paper, anything like that. A Class B is a fuel or flammable liquid fire, and a Class C is an electrical fire. There is a Class K extinguisher out there that is used for kitchen grease fires, but it's not it's not a grease fire at home. It's a grease fire in a restaurant that works in conjunction with the suppression system that's already in the restaurant over the deep fryers. Even if you deep fry every day at home, you don't need it. What people need to remember is an ABC extinguisher will put out all those types of fires. What's in an ABC extinguisher is baking soda. So if someone doesn't have one, or even if they do, maybe have a couple boxes of baking soda around it as well. And when you're cooking, have a lid beside you. It's not attended. If all of a sudden it comes and catches on fire, you can either grab the extinguisher or just cover it with the lid, shut the burner off and move it off the burner. But so important. And, and one last thing I'd like you to say about cooking where a lot of times we have, if you ever do have a fire inside your oven or inside your microwave, don't panic. Just hit the power button. Don't open the door. If you open the door, that rush of oxygen is going to make that fire get even bigger. If you leave the door closed and just hit the power button, there's not enough oxygen there to support the combustion. And that fire will go out in seconds. You're going to have to give your oven or your microwave a good clean but at least your house is still standing and nothing has spread. Troy Hicks, Fire Prevention Officer with the City of Lethbridge Fire Department. Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks again for me, having me, Hal. I really appreciate it. You bet. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.